Attention, due to the nature of the films discussed, the Civil Gore podcast may contain adult language and themes. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 3 of the Civil Gore podcast. How you doing, Brian? All right, Tim, I got a little bit of a uh, sinus or allergy thing going, so I apologize out there. Uh, my voice may be a little bit more obnoxious than normal, but <laughs> hopefully we'll get through it. <laughs> yep, uh, we have a action-packed show today. Lots yes. of stuff going on. Yes, there is. Yeah, we, uh, due to some uh, unforeseen circumstances, we actually have a little bit of some sad news, which we'll get into in the first chop. Yep, and uh, I guess we could kick things off by going right into our first chop because we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, so uh, I watched Castle Freak from 1995 over the weekend, and this is a Stuart Gordon and Jeffrey Combs collaboration, which you'll probably recognize from the uh, Reanimator series. And I've all this you have to go look up the box art to this thing because it's. It's a really weird, it's that typical VHS box art. It's really weird. It's just this shot of the of the creature, the freak or whatever, just standing there. And it, it looks kind of like, it just looks really cheesy and fake. But I always remembered that VHS box art from the time I first saw it. So I guess it did its job. But I never watched the movie. And I didn't realize, I probably would have watched it a lot sooner if I'd known it was a Stuart Gordon film. Uh, but never, just never, never got around to it. Yeah, and now that you said that, I did look up the box art, and I actually remember that as well. Actually, now that I look at that, yeah, I, it's one of those iconic box covers. Yeah, and I like the tagline: "Hideous, hungry, and loose." Yeah, so this this is a weird <laughs> movie. It's so strange. I hated the first half of this movie. It was it was dull. Uh, the the pacing was just not there. It just wasn't very entertaining to me and then the second half it just like ramps up and gets all kinds of strange the the freak in this movie is really well done and it reminded me a lot of the uh, freak from the fun house oh which, yes which we should do sometime because that's one of my favorite toby hooper films yes and i i, do, I bought that special edition yeah. and it's sitting there so we, we definitely need to cover that one yeah that's a great <laughs> one that's one of my all-time favorites but the freak in that one kind of reminded me of the freak in this one it, it's just got some sequences in it that are really disturbing like I, I i didn't expect the level of i guess uh gore and kind of to coin a term that uh, uh the shockwaves podcast used to use a lot rapey <laughs> so it had a lot of rapey sequences that were real creepy, and I just wasn't expecting that out of this movie. But yeah, it's, give that one a shot. It's really strange. The first half is kind of dull, but then it just really ramps up and, and becomes something definitely worth watching. Yeah, I remember. I think I was. Uh, I think we were talking as you were watching that, and you were kind of saying that uh, you were like, you were kind of saying like, you know, it's not. It's kind of boring in the beginning here, and then by the time we finish it, you're like, wow, this thing really picked up. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's really bizarre film, really bizarre. But it, I mean, not not Manitou bizarre, but no, few but it, are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but in its own special way. Yeah, I may have to check that out this week. Yeah. Uh, and that one's also available on Shutter. That's that's where I ran across it. And then I had the opportunity to see Get Out on Saturday night, and I was super hyped for this one. So let me start by taking you back to when was when did Scream come out? Original Scream. Oh God, um, <laughs> I am not prepared uh, to get the IMDb up and the burning. But it's okay. I'm looking it up right now. Ninety six. 1996. Okay, so I remember going to see Scream in the theater in 1996. And I remember the hype around that movie was out of control. And so I went to the theater, and kind of like I did for this one, I was a little, uh, I'm a little cynical when it comes to really hyped movies because uh, I tend to get disappointed. And I remember sitting down the Scream, and, you know, probably 15 minutes in, the audience was into it. And I remember thinking, this is something special. This is a game changer. I, I, now I understand why this is getting the hype. This is going to change the direction of horror movies for the next few years, if not further. And 
I got that same vibe from Get Out. Uh, when I sat down, it, it, it took you know 15, 20 minutes, and I realized there was something special here. And this probably, I think this will be a game changer. You know, we're we're always asking what's the next big genre, or what's the next big uh, you know gimmick in horror movies. You had slashers, you had your torture porn phase, you had oh gosh, um, right the now the two phase. <laughs> yeah, well, we're kind of, and right now we're kind of in the haunting supernatural james wan type stuff uh you had the japanese stuff in the 90s um you had like the teen mystery horror that scream kind of spawned where it, it's kind of a slasher but a kind of a teen mystery uh at the same time this is going to usher in the genre of social horror or horror based around social issues or with some kind of underlying uh and i want to say political uh it's more because it's not preachy uh it's just more issues that we're dealing with uh in a social way uh our modern times and somehow incorporating those into horror and, and turning them into thrillers that way and i must say it's not and i'm not going to go into any spoilers or anything because brian hasn't seen the movie yet yes but now i want to even more than i did <laughs> yeah but, and I, I wouldn't say this one is strictly horror it's it's much more on the psychological thriller side but don't let that discourage you because uh it's funny it is scary um and there's an underlying sense of dread throughout the whole thing and uh, I, I just really had a great time the audience had a great time there was people clapping screaming uh it's really really cool and uh it definitely deserves the uh i think it's sitting at 99 percent right now on rotten tomatoes because there's always got to be that one guy that gives it a bad review but uh, yeah, yeah they, they they have to be different apparently because yeah. I, I I've heard nothing but positives, so uh, you know and now now I was waiting for your review to to cement it even though I was gonna go see it anyway but now that I heard your review um, how good it was I'm I'm probably gonna try and get to see it this week hopefully yeah and I uh, I read that Jordan Peele has said that he's planning on making around four more horror movies based around uh, so, kind of social issues so. I'm really looking forward to that. It was it was quite an entertaining evening. Cool. That makes sense. So how, how did how did uh, uh, Olivia like it? Did she like it? Yeah, she absolutely loved it. And she's uh, Olivia likes horror movies, but she's not. Uh, she doesn't like gore, and she doesn't like stuff that is like what she tends to think is too scary. Like she does she doesn't want to watch Conjuring or Lights Out or anything that she thinks is going to really jump at her. So in a, in a way, this was kind of a perfect horror movie for her because uh, it was more on the psychological tension type end of the spectrum. So she really had a great time, and it, and I, I, God bless her for going with me. You know, she had no clue what this movie was. Um, I think she had seen part of the trailer, and I just said, just trust me on this one. We have to go. It's it's getting rave reviews. So she, you know, she. She took one for the team, but she actually really enjoyed it. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it a lot. I hopefully trying to plan to see it on Wednesday is the, is the plan right now. So yeah, definitely. Good. I mean, it's not one you'd have to see in the theater per se, uh, but I th I think it's 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 one you don't want to hear a lot about before you go see. I definitely don't want anything ruined. So yeah, see that that's more the reason why I want to. Um to go in because it's funny because if you think about it you know like anything nowadays with the internet it just you it's hard not to get spoiled by something like even back when you know when six cents came six cents came out it was uh you know everyone knew about the, the surprise ending they didn't know what and the internet was still kind of kind of in its infancy that i mean no i guess it was around but i guess there wasn't as many spoiler sites and and uh and message boards and Twitter was not around, and I don't even I don't think Facebook was around that, or at least it wasn't as common as it is now. So there was really, you know, you could avoid the spoilers. Now you might as you pretty much have to stay off the internet if you don't want to be spoiled. Yeah, and I hate it when when a review says I'm not going to tell you what the big twist is at the end, but there's a right, and I'm like that's that's a spoiler in itself because now I'm going to spend the whole movie trying to figure out the twist ending that you just told me was coming. Right, and actually, I, when I saw uh, The Sixth Sense, I didn't 
know there was a twist ending. I remember I, I just thought the trailers looked amazing. Uh, so I went opening night, and so I, I had no clue what was coming, and I was just blown away. And, you know, obviously then, you know, after that, any anything uh, M. Night Shyamalan does, you now expect it. So, but, but, you know, at the time it was great because I had no clue and I just told everyone, I said, go see it. I'm not going to tell you why. Just trust me. It's amazing. Go see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, and, and that, you know, we were talking about last episode, this, this trend of comedy people getting involved in horror. This was a perfect example of what a comedian can bring to horror because there were parts of this movie that were downright hilarious but that did not subtract from the horror aspect. It wasn't a horror comedy per se, but it had enough levity in it that uh, it, it served to break the tension when it needed to and just made it really entertaining that way. See, and I think that's where uh, that that's where I, I think they could um, do really well with uh, people with comedic background doing horror because horror is a lot. I, I personally think, you know, everyone's afraid of something, so it's easy to portray, but to make the person laugh in most horror movies their laughs are done in a cheesy way but if you got a good comedy chops behind it it comes so much more naturally i assume all right so uh the next thing on the ticket is slay away camp yeah slay away camp i actually saw on facebook i guess it was a sponsored post and i took a look at it and i actually shared it on on our facebook page asking if anyone played it and so I finally got around to this weekend, and as soon as, after about 10 minutes, I I uh, texted Tim, and I'm like, you gotta play this game. This thing is addicting as hell, it's perfect, it couldn't have come out at a better, well, I, I, actually, I'm not sure when it came out, but we couldn't have discovered it at a better time with just starting the podcast, because <laughs> this thing is, um, I, it's, okay, it's basically like, I guess it's a series of those blocky games. Like, uh, what was there, a smash blocky or something with the cars? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's the best way to describe it. And it's a puzzle game, but it's themed to 80s slasher films. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a puzzle you've probably seen before where you can move a, a block or an object, but it, it has to keep going until it hits something. So right, you, it's almost like the rook in chess. You can go up and down, I guess, but you can't, and you just go, you can go, kind of go straight lines, that's it. Right, so you're trying to figure out, each each puzzle is laid out as a scene in, in this horror movie, and you're playing the killer, and so you're trying to take out all the people in that scene, but of course you're limited by your movement, and... There are, there's hazards you can bump into that kill you. There's cops that can catch you, uh, stuff like that. But make no mistake, it's not it's not a slasher simulator or anything like that. It is a true puzzle game, but it's got a really cool theme overlaid on top of it. If you're a horror fan and like puzzle games, it's a pretty cool blend. Yeah, and it it does get it does get really challenging. And I think it was the third third uh, story because they do it in stories so the first one was Sl slay away camp then return to slay away camp and i think the third one was uh another return to slay away camp but um and it's funny it almost looks like an old vhs tape box is uh, is where you select uh which level you want and it and the, the, I, I guess it goes to a tv screen up there where you can hit play on like so it has that like old 80s vcr ish uh twist to it a little bit i guess and you know as you go on you can get more uh different kind of kills for your character i think eventually you become uh it, it you know i mean out of all the slashes definitely heavy heavy on friday the 13th obviously with the with the being at a camp and then uh, i guess one of the killers later is, is the mother as opposed to and it even the uses character. the uh the, the ch -ch -ch -ch. <sighs> yes it does soundtrack. yeah oh and that's right the sound on it is pretty good and it's got that voice that that does the little just when you thought it was safe to go back to the camp yeah kind of thing and it's it's really really fun it, and very addicting so yeah when you kill a and they have different kills for so when you kill a, a camper or whatever you know it might be the two arrows through the eye or it might be the you know, the hedge clippers through the neck or it just uses these different kills you've seen in slasher movies before of course it's all cartoony so it's not like yeah. overly gory or anything but 
It's pretty and funny. it's kind of and it's kind of funny. They have names. I, I think with the pitchfork, it call, it's as pronged yeah. as you <laughs> as you like split in half. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. It's also available on Steam for PC, but I think it's quite a bit more expensive there. Uh, so I, I went with the iOS version. Yeah, I think it's like two ninety nine or something. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, definitely worth the two ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Check that one out. And so finally, our last segment for First Chop was the unfortunate passing of Bill Paxton, who was definitely one of my favorite actors. And uh, yeah, mine too. Yeah, that that was a that was a stunner. And out of the blue, he was, uh, you know, most people know him from Aliens and Twister and stuff like that. But he was a huge uh, horror star for uh, a lot of the '80s, early '90s. Uh, I was I kind of went through IMDb and was just picking out some of the some of the actual horror movies. I'm not even including a lot of the thrillers and you know action thrillers, psychological thrillers he was in. Uh, but some of them included uh, Night Warning from 1982, Mortuary 1983, Impulse 1984, Near Dark, which is one of my favorites, 1987, Brain Dead 1990, Predator Predator 2 1990, The Vagrant 1992. Uh, Future Shock 1994, Club Dread 2004, The Colony 2013, and uh, even some appearances in the Hitchhiker TV series and the Tales from the Crypt series. One of my one of my favorites from 2001 was Frailty, which he actually starred and directed in. Yeah, I have to still see that one. Yeah, uh, but I I know it's supposed to be really good. And actually, we were discussing right before we uh, started recording. We we think we're gonna. Um take uh, one of the Bill Paxton movies for our next uh, episode to review. Yeah, I'm not quite sure which one we're going to do yet, but uh, I think that'd be a nice tribute, so we'll probably do that. So there's your tease for episode four. Yep, there you <laughs> go. So Brian came up with a title for our next segment, which, you know, by the way, let me pause here and say we're still playing around with the format of the show. Uh, what, you're, what you've gotten so far is pretty much how it's going to be set up, but we're still kind of, you know, moving things around, renaming segments and things, trying to get it to, to flow a little better uh, so you'll see some continuous improvement here and, and one of those improvements this week was to move the first chop news to its own segment and the blu-ray releases to their own segment and so brian came up with the brilliant name of disc memberment yeah I, i'm i'm quite uh uh quick with puns <laughs> Unf- unfortunately to the people close to me but <laughs> so until we come up with a better name that's what we're going with so yeah. If, you, if you have something better, feel free to post it on our Facebook page. But for now, that's what we're going with. So uh, the Blu-ray releases for March 7th, 2017. Uh, not a lot here except for one, which is a collector's edition steel book. Uh, we'll talk about that one in a second. So let's run through some of these. We have Pulse from 1988. Not to be confused with the uh, Japanese film Pulse, which I think was very well received. This is a... I had to look up the the summary because I didn't know what this movie was. And it was something about an intelligent pulse of electricity stalking people through a house, and it stars Joey Lawrence. Ah, interesting. So, <laughs> so uh, that's probably not going on my buy list. Yeah, I think that one may be a, a rare skip for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next we have The Eyes of My Mother, which came out last year. I've heard really good things about. So I do want to see that one. I don't know if I'm going to be getting the Blu-ray because it seems like it's a pretty bare-bones release, but that one's gotten some good hype. Uh, next we have, we have Incarnate 2016. I don't know yeah, much where, about that one. Where did I see that? Was that the one that's on Shudder as a as an exclusive? I know Shudder had something similar to that. It I could may be, wrong. be uh, It may be. Uh, I'm not sure. That one's also kind of a limited bare bones release i think it just had a featurette on it so i'll probably pass on that one uh we have the lesson from 2015 which is a scream factory release but it's not a collector's edition i don't think it had much on it i I don't really know much about that movie and the uh, last one i hinted to at was popcorn from 1991 i'm looking forward to that i love that movie i haven't seen it in ages too so that's going to be an automatic buy yeah i couldn't remember much about this obviously i remember the box art because the box art is incredible but i remember seeing this and i remember enjoying it quite a bit but i have i literally have not seen it since 1991 so i didn't i I went and looked at the trailer just to see if i could refresh my memory and i was like i (laughs) i have no clue I, i do not remember this movie at all i just remember that i enjoyed it so 
I, I'm definitely yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, and I thought, I'm looking, because uh, I'm actually recording in my uh, room where I have all my Blu-rays and DVDs, I could have sworn I actually had that on uh, on DVD, but apparently I don't even, I never upgraded from my videotape of that, <laughs> so I, now, now that, if there wasn't a sure buy before, it's definitely a sure buy now, because I need to, yeah, I since I don't even think VCRs work anymore. <laughs> yeah, this one's got a new 2K scan, a new audio mix, and a new commentary and it, I don't know if it's a new commentary but it has a, has a commentary and interviews so uh, I'll probably be picking that one up yeah I'm that de- yeah that's definitely a, that's a given for me too now I will say just from the trailer alone it does not look like it aged well but mm. but it, sh- it could still be fun so we'll see yeah, well, I mean, if, if you notice, we have not, <laughs> I just realized this today as I was looking at the rundown for the show, we have not done a movie that is outside of the 70s <laughs> on our podcast. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, that's one reason I kind of uh, figured for next movie, even, even if we didn't do a Bill Paxton, I was going to try to go a little more modern, uh, just to, just to, so you don't think we're stuck in the uh, Grindhouse era, but. Yeah, yeah. I was. It was so funny when I was doing that. I'm like, wow, seventy eight was like is the latest. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But those we'll movies are so fun. Forward. I I love. I really love that time period for horror. This oh yeah, seventies and eighties. I just love it. So, you, you'll probably see us gravitate to that more often than not. But we'll try to throw in some more modern stuff here and there too. Yeah. Well, Shutter is is part of the reason they they tend to to lean towards a, a lot of the the classic ones. Right. Right. Uh, theatrical releases for March 3rd, we have The Institute, which is in limited release, and it may be, may be day and date DVD, and it's something about a 19th century insane asylum, so I'm probably in just from that. I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm a sucker for that. I love 19th century stuff. I love insane asylums. You put them together, and I'm there. Yeah, <laughs> plus it sounds like a great like haunt that would be at a, one of the theme parks during yeah. Halloween. I mean, I don't know much about it. I don't know if it's actually any good, but... Yeah, I'll probably check that one out. Theatrical releases, I tend to try to stick with wide release stuff because there's so many little indie films that come out uh, that that people can't actually go see in the theater because it's only in the big cities. But uh, if there's some that that are really interesting or that I think uh, are getting a lot of good press or good reviews, I'll, I'll probably you know mention those. Oh, you know what? Now that you uh mention that the institute i know where i read that that's the one with um james franco oh okay. right huh. right i believe yeah it's Maybe. james franco pamela anderson topher grace what? josh duhamel if this is the same one this is what this is um let me see if this is the right one and or i'm completely off and it just happened to have the same name <laughs> but, no you're right um, you're right yeah yeah so it that's is. that Oh, wow, it's got some 80s people in there, too, like Laurie Singer, Eric Roberts. Huh? Oh, I'll, yeah. I'm going to have anything that stars James Franco and Pamela Anderson and Topher Grace. I'm going to have to see this out of mor- right. morbid curiosity alone. Yeah, I mean, when you, you team those three together, it's a dream team, apparently. But <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, we I may have to go uh, try and look this up. I mean, I, I do have the luxury of being just a uh less than an hour train ride into manhattan and i'm sure it will be playing there at some one of the obscure theaters if uh yeah that sounds it comes out that sounds bizarre yeah this will be interesting yeah definitely got to check that one out <laughs> all right well that brings us to our movie of the week yes and that movie we chose uh was well we found out uh as you know throughout the the show if you've been listening tim and i tend to just keep finding more and more similarities and we discovered we both have a weird fear of crocodiles and uh you know since at least i know i haven't actually encountered one it seems a little bit obscure of a fear but (laughs) yeah well let me tell you the story about this so when i was younger i was probably oh i don't know maybe five or six uh we have a lake in town that has alligators in it oh. and, and we're not i mean i'm obviously not ferocious you know florida type alligators it's you know they're fairly small and docile but you know when you're five or six there's no alligator that's small and docile no <laughs> so but you could rent canoes to go out on this lake or paddle boats or things like that 
Well, I remember there's uh, there's one section of the lake, and you can see it from the road. There's a small sign nailed to a tree, and it says, Danger, no swimming, alligators in lake. And that sign used to always terrify me because, you know, it's nailed up to this cypress tree, you know, in the middle of this lake. And all I could think about was all the alligators swimming in there. So <laughs> my dad took me out on the canoe one day and we had rented it for an hour. And so we go out and he starts steering over towards that sign. And so I'm like screaming, dad, no, 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 there's alligators. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. They're, you know, they're scared of us. And. So he goes over there, and then he starts getting, you know, thinks it's kind of funny to scare me. So he starts, you know, paddling over to where the alligator sign is. And by this point, I'm just screaming bloody murder. And <laughs> I finally cried so much, he had to bring the canoe in 45 minutes early. And we, oh my and God. we had to leave. So I, I believe that's the psychological root of my alligator fear. Oh, no, I was going to say, and you know, you realize that if uh, if that was a horror movie that would have been exactly the beginning of this movie and an alligator would come out and eaten your father. Yeah. Well then <laughs> to compound on that, one of the first horror movies I ever saw and I remember seeing it on TV was the movie Alligator. Oh my god, I remember that. Wow, that's I think I saw that on TV too way back in the day. Yeah. And I would I think that was 1980 according to IMDb. And that movie scared the crap out of me because there's a scene in there where there's a kid, I believe he's at a birthday party or something, but he's blindfolded and he they make him walk onto the diving board of the pool. And I may be misremembering this, so please don't scream at the podcast. But uh, <laughs> I remember there's an alligator in the pool. The alligator is in the pool and the kid's about to, to walk in there. And it just freaked me out. I mean, I was like six or seven years old when I saw this movie. And one of the first horror movies I'd ever seen, so that pretty much scarred me for life as well. Yeah, I, I could see that. <laughs> My mine is even is I guess definitely irrational. As I you know, I mean I remember that movie, but I think it was the stories I would overhear of of uh, the rumored alligators that are in the sewer system of New York City. And when I used to go visit my dad, who lived in the city at the time, you know, I mean it's bad enough you would ever see an occasional rat, I guess, but knowing the fact that supposedly there's these alligators now in the sewer didn't probably help my uh my my little weird fear about those <laughs> yeah and that was the whole premise of alligator was right that the alligators got flushed <laughs> down the toilet and that's where these giant mutant alligators came from so that's pretty funny uh now the movie we're going to discuss tonight uh is not technically a killer alligator movie Although it does no. feature a killer crocodile, which they're quick to point out, it is not an alligator; it is a crocodile. Right. I think that's in the first uh, few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a very special beer pairing for this one. You want to take yes. that, Brian? Yeah. So the beer pairing tonight uh, was, I mean, uh, I guess a little obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had this beer, but it's called Crocodile Original. It's a it's a lager and it has the tagline "World's Best Lager." I don't know if that's just because they're trying to scare you with the crocodile on the bottle, but um, it's by a brewery I've never heard of. I guess Krone Lines. Um, it's from Sweden, so I could be pronouncing that wrong. Cause, uh, but anyway, so based on obviously the movie we're about to speak of, crocodile lager would sound like the perfect beer pairing yeah, for this movie. And I actually I actually <laughs> looked up some reviews of this beer. And uh, they they match pretty well with the reviews of the movie I saw. Oh, okay. Which was not good. <laughs> so so world's best lager is I guess, uh, is probably just uh, is someone's uh, wish I yeah, guess. <laughs> but hey, it, it makes the pairing that much better. Right. I mean, I think we'll have a lot uh, harder time for some other movies to try and find a beer pairing with, but this one was kind of a no brainer. <laughs> yep. So the movie we're doing tonight is Toby Hooper's. 1976 movie Eaten Alive. It was his follow-up to The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And Brian, I must say, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is in my top five, hands down. Yes, it's one of I my agree. favorite movies. But I have to say, I was a little, a little disappointed in this one. Yeah, and and speaking of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think that's definitely one we'll do it. Uh, guaranteed on the podcast uh, at some point and I think we should have uh, the beard man on you know since he comes from Texas I think he'd be a good uh, oh yeah that'd be guest, great. guest on that show that'd be great <laughs> but um yeah and he now obviously you know any horror fan knows Toby Hooper he's done 
a lot of uh, classics. I mean, especially ones that we've already mentioned, uh, such as The Fun House, Salem's Lot, Poltergeist, Life Force, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And so, you know, he does obviously have earned his horror chops. Um, I guess this is still kind of early on in his career, so we can maybe give him a pass on this one. I mean, there are a lot of similarities uh, to Texas Chainsaw Massacre in this. And actually, when I read the uh, the little synopsis, it uh, kind of refers to that, which I'll, I'll do now. So this is uh, Shudder's uh, synopsis on it. And I, I left out a couple of lines in there because we're going to get to it anyway uh, in the review. But uh, here's what I have. So, A crazy veteran's backwoods hotel comes complete with a hungry, hungry crocodile in Toby Hooper's fearsome follow-up to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Using a wild beast instead of a man with a chainsaw, Hooper serves up another chilling cautionary tale about pissing off the wrong folks when traveling through the wild backcountry of America. So yeah, that's the main similarity right there, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, it... it definitely has sort of the same feel the texas chainsaw massacre it feels grimy it feels dirty you have these weird backwoods characters but uh there's something there's just something missing there there's something odd about it i I couldn't quite put my finger on but it just does not have that same eerie feel that the texas chainsaw massacre had yeah yeah i mean texas chainsaw massacre are just I, I don't. I feel like you could. It's and not, not say realistic. I guess, but you can kind of see that happening a little more than this one. <laughs> well, I think I think in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the low budget actually worked for it. Right. Whereas right. in this movie, the low budget worked against it. Yeah, and we'll get to it. I'm sure, but the crocodile was uh, was horrendous effect. Yeah, that, that was. It was pretty bad. <laughs> the, the other thing, and I, and I read this after the fact, which you could already tell when you saw the movie, but this this whole, whereas Texas Chainsaw Massacre obviously took place on location, uh, this one was all done on a, on a soundstage, on a set, So, and it definitely shows. You could, it's very, It has a very artificial quality to it. Yeah, it just, it, and like a lot of the shots, you could tell were almost, like the camera was in the same spot for the entire time and they just kept redoing shots in front of the cameras if to save time and money i guess there was, it was very very uh I, I it wasn't very inventive in terms of uh camera angles or anything <laughs> right and they used well, well we'll get into it a little later let's uh let's just kind of go through you know some of these scenes uh, and we'll get to some of that as we as we discuss yeah, so uh, this movie begins uh, with a bang, almost literally, I'll say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, it starts off with Robert Englund, and so there's right there is an icon. So if you don't know Robert Englund, obviously, you might as well just turn off the podcast. Don't ever listen to it again, because <laughs> he's. if you don't know him, you, you're obviously not a horror fan at all and don't know what we're talking about 99% of the time. But anyway, he comes in, and the first line of this movie, and I'm going to obviously, uh, we're not going to bleep this out, so any kids, you might want to hide. He comes on and says, hi, I'm Buck, and I'm rearing a fuck. <laughs> so, <laughs> and at that so point, what, you know what kind of movie you're about to get into. Yeah, you, you know you're in for a little bit of uh, uh, a, a different type of film here. And so, he's in a brothel, and I'm going to... I, the way I took it is, I guess he's trying... I'm going to use the old mole, rat, mole rats line. Uh, he looks like he wants to take this uh, prostitute and screw her in the back of a Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> it's the way I took that. Yeah. <laughs> and she refuses and causes a scene, which I guess draws the attention of the madam, which is Miss Hattie, who comes up and why she's wearing one of those like World Series of Poker green cellophane visors, I'll have no idea. I guess that's for counting all her money. I don't, you know, they yeah, use, people that wear those usually are counting money. I don't yeah, know. I guess. Yeah, I, I, what does that do? Does the green? I guess, and the green of the money. I don't. Does it do something? <laughs> I just I thought know. it seemed out of place. <laughs> it just. I. I didn't know what the point was. But did you notice who that was? By the way. Yes, that was Carolyn Jones, who was the original Morticia Adams. Yes. So already within about five minutes, you have two horror icons in this thing. Now, let me stop here. Did did she not look weird? Like, her face looked weird. Like, she had some weird makeup on or something. Yeah. It was really I, it, odd. 
Yeah, and her face almost looked a little like square. I guess it looked. The best it almost like they just caked makeup on her. I don't know. It was it was strange. I don't know. Yeah, and and when was the Adams family? Was it that much? I, I mean, I don't remember that was, his. It, that was in the sixties. Right. Was she that old then that that she aged so horribly within like within about ten years? <laughs> so it says she was born in nineteen thirty. So she would have been, I guess, in her thirties when she did the Adams family. So I mean, she couldn't have been that old. Yeah, she, I mean, she died at age fifty three in nineteen eighty three. So she was what? Huh. So she must have been. Uh, this was what seventy six. Seventy six. So she was only be like forty seven. Yeah, may, maybe she was sick. I, I yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Weird. Yeah, I, yeah. She just didn't. She didn't look right. Recognizable, but not not. You know, I didn't. Yeah, it just she does. She did look odd, is the best way. But um, so she comes up, and obviously, it, you kind of it kind of implies that Buck is one of their best customers, and kind of gets his way. So she gets uh, Clara, who's the is the the prostitute whose name gets thrown out, and I guess one of the workers there is really nice uh, elderly woman. Kind of says, uh, gives her some money, and says, "Okay, just go down the go down the way and go to the Starlight Hotel." And, you know, she said, whatever you do, though, don't let on that you're one of Miss Hattie's girls, which kind of is obviously a little foreboding message there. So, you know, that's going to mean something soon enough. And um, so she makes it down to this rundown and creepy looking hotel. And before you know it, this guy, uh, Judd, comes out, who is uh, looks like one of those like crocodile skinners. <laughs> one more foreshadow, I guess. And... So he's a creepy looking dude right off the bat. Yeah, and he was played and, by Neville Brand. Who? Yeah, well, I didn't see much of his history. I'm not sure what he's done. But he was in a lot of stuff up and all through the 70s, uh, mo but mostly TV. Oh, okay. But okay. but he did a really good job in this movie. I mean, he is super creepy. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if I saw him at a hotel, I'd be not checking in and turning around. <laughs> So, but you know, the funny thing is when he when he starts checking her in, he seems like he's weird, but he's not quote unquote you know dangerous yet. He's just really odd, and but you know, there's something off. So he as he's walking her up to the room, I guess he figures out based on her attire that she was one of Miss Hattie's girls. Yeah, and her Dolly he starts, Parton wig. Right. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Dolly Parton wig must have gave it away. Poor Dolly. We love Dolly, <laughs> by the way. But, uh, and, uh, so she, he freaks out and starts chasing her with a pitchfork. Um, and he kills her and then dumps her into the water. And you see, I mean, it was kind of a dark scene, but it, you can kind of tell that there's a crocodile or some creature in there that comes and devours her. Yeah. This whole movie, so apparently, this whole uh, movie's dark, dark, dark. I mean, not yeah, dark, yeah. not dark. I mean, dark in terms of tone, yes, but also like just film dark. I think it's another thing that just that I didn't like about it because if you look at Texas Chainsaw, a lot of it's outside and it's brightly lit, and this one was just murky, really murky. Yeah, yeah. I think this was probably to hide the effects and lack of uh, cinematography. <laughs> but uh, and it's it's kind of funny that this guy is, is so anti brothel and anti and because. Based on as you'll you'll get to know his character more in this movie, you realize what that it's obviously some kind of misplaced morality that he has. <laughs> yeah. Because, because I don't know why he has something against that when all the other things he does. But so anyway, so uh, the a little bit about this hotel. Apparently, it's it's on a, a lake, or there's a water, uh, there's a pond right next like to it. Right I, off thought, I think it's like a swamp. Right. right, that's what I thought, but it, there, it, yeah, I couldn't tell if there was actual, it was a swamp or just a lake, or but it, yeah, that's what I originally had, that it was a swamp, but, and so, and I, did he, now I could be wrong here, but it looked like one of the chairs had a swastika on it, <laughs> was I, that? I don't, I didn't catch that, but I wouldn't surprise yeah, me. Yeah, because this guy was really odd, and he had rifles on the wall, and apparently the hotel also doubles as a zoo. Because there's a monkey in a cage on the porch, <laughs> which inexplicably dies. I couldn't tell why. It just looked like it had a heart attack or something. Probably from I seeing mean, the woman getting eaten by the crocodile. Yeah, that's that's what <laughs> that's what I assume because I guess the monkey has, has seen a lot in his day at the, <laughs> that hotel. So then a, a, 
uh, after that, a family... It seems like they just keep coming one after another here, but then a family arrives. Uh, it's Roy, Faye, and a little young girl. And uh, my first question is, okay, now this is the second person. How did they find this place? Because I really can't see this yelping too well. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like, I can't see that being advertised. This guy obviously doesn't want anybody in his hotel other than to to get it to kill them and feed them to his crocodiles but so they uh, they arrived there and did you actually catch who that little girl was now yeah well i did not catch it until i looked this up on imdb but that is none other than kylie richards yes who we now so basically we have two of her movies and out of the three that we've reviewed so far (laughs) so it that that'd be a guest to get on the show at some point obviously yeah (laughs) but uh yeah so she was Lindsay wallace in halloween and so she has a much more expanded role in this one, um, as we'll get to. So, this family shows up and has uh, it's the the mother, the father, the little girl, and a little dog. And I guess as they're about to check in, the dog gets eaten by the crocodile, and basically all hell breaks loose. This little girl is screaming bloody murder. They're running her upstairs. Judd, the, who's the hotel uh, owner, is just mumbling to himself incoherently. And the father just some weird freak out and starts fighting with his wife upstairs. This was the weirdest scene yeah. I've ever seen. This is, uh, So the father's played by William Finley. And if you've known his work, he's a little bit of an oddball anyway. He's very tall and lanky and kind of weird. But he, all of a sudden, he just starts fighting flipping out on his wife and barking like a dog and yeah and he's convinced his eye came out or something it's weird <laughs> it's the weird because it comes out of nowhere yeah i i really i, I yeah I, that one's a, that i was i was sitting there i'm like what did it did i miss something did i miss I where to, he got i the... had to rewind it just to make sure that i didn't miss something leading up to this but uh you know imagine he's just sitting there you know, obviously he's upset that the dog got eaten and all this stuff, but then all of a sudden he just starts getting really flipped out. It was strange, very strange. Yeah, it, yeah, and he just, yeah. So his, and, uh, you got the girl crying on the bed. The mother, the wife is fighting with him, and then he finally, after this barking and and worrying that his eye was gouged out, he runs downstairs and uh, I guess he grabs one, a gun and decided he's going to kill this this uh, crocodile here and. So, this guy has his freak out moment, but right before that, another uh, two people show up to this hotel. It's an older man, and at, f- at first I couldn't, I thought he would look drunk, but I, I guess you find out later he's just sick. This man and his daughter show up to this hotel, and once again, I'm, uh, I'm curious to where people keep finding this place. <laughs> I really don't know if there's, where, wherever this town is, if they have, if they're, they're the only sole advertiser in the town guide. So people keep showing up at this hotel. And um, they find out that they're looking for, uh, I guess, his lost daughter, her sister, which is, you find out, is Clara, the girl from the beginning, which the audience obviously knows her fate. So they go looking for her, and then this this point, the father goes running out I, and grabs a gun and decides to go ahead uh, and try and kill this crocodile, which Judd seems very defensive about so at that point i assume he he considers that as his pet right is that what you got out of that not only his pet but his means of disposing bodies because you can obviously he's done this before right but it almost seems like he was sacrificing them it's like he had some weird deal with this crocodile like i'll give you stuff you'll leave me alone kind of a thing yeah but yeah, it was that, that part was obviously the weak uh, point in this plot that they didn't really go and explain why he does this. But but anyway, so so he goes after uh, he goes after this the father is named Roy, and he goes after him with one of those big hay sickles. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he, he goes after him, and the crocodile pops up during this and eats the guy, and then for some reason. Judd goes and sits down and eats a pile of powder, <laughs> which I assume was cocaine. I don't know. What, uh, what was that? There's, there's a lot uh, Just there's a lot to this movie, like the aforementioned scene where the dad freaks out on the wife, that just doesn't make any sense. It just comes out of nowhere, and it's never explained, and it, I, I don't know. It's, it's just, 
I, I don't know if it's just bad editing or if it's bad script or if it was just stuff that was just cut out. I, I don't know. It's strange. Yeah, it's, I, 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 it's probably all three. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, and so so he's after he does that, I guess he's rubbing, and you see that he has a uh, a wooden leg, which I assume was either some old war injury or he the crocodile ate it. And it, really, it could be both, in all honesty. I know you would think it's got to be the crocodile, but you kind of get the sense that he was some uh, veteran, I guess, because in with post-traumatic syndrome, because he's off the charts 90% of this movie. And, and then it just shows him going, bringing the suitcases upstairs, and he puts one down nicely, and the other one he just throws and kicks against the door <laughs> out of frustration. So I, it, it's apparent he really doesn't enjoy the duties of running this hotel. <laughs> No. Yeah, and so then the I guess uh, the mother mother who does uh, the wife or mother whatever doesn't realize where the husband is, and I guess she runs out and he kind of says, "Oh, he'll be up in a second. Yeah. So I guess the mother decides she's gonna go take a, a a bath, and they keep cutting back to I guess the what he what uh, this guy Judd's doing and the girl in the bed and the. The mother um, changing, which I swear to God, it must take this woman, it looks like, 45 minutes to, to remove, like, one layer of clothes. And this is where and you get a lot, of, tub. a lot of gratuitous boob shots here. Yeah, well, actually, she, she I don't think she shows anything at that point. She's just in a skimpy outfit. And that's, uh, I guess, yeah, she's actually just wearing this, uh, you know, skimpy outfit. But there's a lot of that in this movie that, that they show. And um, if you notice, uh, that is Marilyn Burns. Uh fans of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'm sure recognized her right away, so obviously Toby Hooper liked her performance in that and had her back. Um, un, un, I guess uh, bad, her, bad luck on her part <laughs> for being in this. And um, So, she, while she's in there, Judd is kind of just kind of wandering around, so they keep cutting back and forth, and he kind of realizes that she's in there and he goes in to try and attack her she kind of gets out, and during that time, the little girl wakes up, sees what's going on, and runs out of the house. And so, once again, Judd comes out with his, his hay sickle yeah. <laughs> and goes after the little girl, who is pretty resilient, I have to say. She's smart. She goes, she uses her, her size and gets underneath the hotel and is crawling around under there, and in that time, Judd I guess gives up on her and goes up and ties the mother up onto the bed and he makes like some weird owl sound I guess yeah. the, the whole the whole the introduction of the little girl kind of like disturbed me about this movie because through most of the movie she's underneath the house hiding from this guy while upstairs you know he's got a woman tied to the bed and he's attacking other women and it's and there's nudity and it just really rubbed me the wrong way that there's this kid involved in this whole movie because it's just so grimy and and gross and there's so many like obscene things going on that it just i just didn't like the feeling that there's this kid like in close proximity to all this stuff yeah and, and at one point i mean the way this movie goes normally there's that whole unwritten rule in the in horror movies that the kids are you're going to be okay this movie i wasn't so sure the way he was going after her and the way this movie was going, I wouldn't have been surprised if this guy literally fed her to the crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, it was really, like, it was kind of, it was, yeah, there was a bit of uncomfortableness to that. And um, so, but the good thing is she kind of pretty much stays under there. They cut back to her every once in a while, but she's pretty much under the, the, the hotel for the majority of the movie at that point. <laughs> yeah. So, so then... Um, I guess then we we kind of uh, follow back with the father and daughter, and they make their way to the police station, and they go to report that the uh, the daughter slash sister is missing, and so they first head over to uh, the brothel again, and they interview Miss Hattie, who's still got her visor on and yeah. <laughs> still looking odd, and she claims she goes, I never saw her before. So at that point, I mean, I could be wrong. I'm thinking that. It's almost that the whole town kind of knows what goes on at this hotel, and maybe except the sheriff, and they kind of just turn a blind eye to it, which has seemed to me another similarity to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, exactly. It, re it reminded me a lot of that. You know, that you have this this 
this outsider type town that everybody's kind of kind of turns the other way and, and ignores the dark goings on that are happening underneath yeah I, yeah yeah and it's so that it's just yeah so you know you're kind of at that point you're like all right this you know it, it becomes very very predictable and 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 you know it really has no originality i mean of course maybe back at the time it would have, uh, you know, would have played better, but I haven't seen anyone really review it super, super well. So, <laughs> so probably just never played the way they wanted it to. But um, so the after that, the sheriff drops the father back at the hotel and decides to take the daughter out for for uh, I guess a meal. She's hungry, and they go to the thing, and Judd and this actually this is my probably my favorite scene in terms of horror. Judd kills the father, and that is a brutal scene. Yes. He's got that haysicle right through his neck, and it just blood is pouring out, and he's still kind of walking around trying to survive. And I was like, you know, finally, that's a scene. And, you know? and that's Judd, a... Judd actually seemed kind of disturbed by it. Like, after he did it, he kind of acted like, oh, my God, like, what did I do? You know, he had this kind of look yeah. on his face. Like, like it, it disturbed even him. Yeah, because I got to tell you, that was probably – overall in terms of this best film sequence because it was it had some good gore to it it was creepy and it was disturbing and so yeah so i i like that part and so basically he's he's staggering around with this this blade right through his neck and blood pouring out and he stumbles in and then gets fed to the crocodile of course so (laughs) they cut then to uh to the bar where sheriff and uh, libby which is the daughter or or uh, having coffee, and I don't know why. I, this is just me being I, as one of. I guess this is my thing, but I found it odd that when the waitress comes and takes the order, she orders chicken fried steak. I don't know why. <laughs> to be <laughs> interesting, I mean, I order that all the time at like uh, Cracker Barrel and stuff, but it seemed like such an odd choice. Yeah, well, there's a lot of odd choices I, in this movie, so yeah, I, there, yeah, uh, but uh, I don't know why. I just put that in my notes because I felt it odd. But and then we get to see our good friend Buck, who returns again. Uh, and he's and, so young in this movie; it's amazing to see him. Yeah, and, and but the thing is, it's like you could tell. It's like you could tell he was. Uh, you know, you could see little bits of how well he'll he was going to play Freddy in this. Oh yeah, I me. mean, he's one of the best actors in this whole movie, easily. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's to be and I guess he really he ages well because. Nightmare was years later, and he pretty much almost looks the same in the the original. You know, when you used to see him do uh, press for a night, you know, without mm-hmm. the makeup, yeah. he didn't never looked old to me. Yeah, he yeah. I mean, if you're if you're a horror fan, he's probably the probably the best reason to watch this movie is just to see him, you know, doing his thing outside of the Freddy makeup and, and just acting. Yeah, one reason to one of the few reasons I can give to watch yeah. this movie. Yeah, there aren't many, but that's one. You know what? Now you may, now I was thinking maybe he looks so good all the time is because he he must have stole the life force from uh, Carolyn Jones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why she looks With so horrible. His manatee. Yeah, there you go. See, nice callback. See, <laughs> we're we're very we're big on callbacks here at the Civil Gore, and uh, so in, in another one of the the many unexplicably odd scenes in this, there's. I guess uh, Buck and Robert England. He's he's there with uh, a young girl, which I I think they try to imply that she's underage or at least under twenty one and not a drinking age because there's a comment there. But his friend, I guess, spot spots someone looking at this girl, and he guys to confront him in typical macho thing. But he does this weird slap fight thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I don't know. It, it was one of those scenes that just seemed like I don't I didn't really see the point in it. It was. I, I don't know. Conti- yeah, I, continue. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally just put slap fight because I don't know the way to explain. He just keeps slapping himself down the sides like he's doing some kind of like self frisking maneuver, and then he slaps the guy once, and the guy just shoves him against the thing, and that's the end of it. Really had no point well, to this movie at all. It, it goes back to the dad with the weird freak out against the wife, and and some of the stuff Judd does. There's a lot of things where the characters in this just act really bizarre. And I can see that as an intentional choice if you're trying to make the viewer uneasy. 
because you just ah, oh, that's true. You know, yeah. you don't know what they're gonna do. They're unpredictable, and, and it gives them these character quirks. And, and you saw this, and you've seen this in all the Texas Chainsaw movies. You know, there's always these weird quirks these people have. So I, maybe I can kind of see that as an intentional choice, but in the context of this movie, none of it ever really, no, none of it ever really gels to the point where I thought, oh, yeah, that that's a this guy's acting weird and that's a cool quirk or, or, or that's a good it just never never gelled for me it always just seemed so random right it, it never played as well as it does in in, uh, in chainsaw massacre because there you, you kind of you're, you're you're so engrossed in the movie i think in this it's so hard to get engrossed in it to begin with right so then everything seems out of place more than it should it should have I'm sure his intention was, like you said, to just make an uneasiness, a, a weird, erratic kind of thing. But instead, it's just like, okay, one more odd thing you're throwing in that makes no sense, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, so so Buck... Oh, you know, we did we did forget one scene. Uh, um, Buck, at one point, before this bar scene goes, actually shows up at the hotel and gives Judd some money. And Judd does not want to have any of it. And he says, no, get out of here. We got real folks here. So... I guess I, at that point I'm not sure what happens, but you find out now that he basically uses that as his as his stomping grounds. I don't know if Buck doesn't have a house or he lives with his mother. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But so he basically shows back up to the hotel with this this uh, girl, and once again Judd is really upset and does not want him there. But he goes. He decides he can't really get kick him out because Buck kind of threatens him. And for some, I, I was surprised actually. Buck kind of has a way with this guy to where he kind of he's not afraid of him, obviously. And and this guy Judd actually looks a little bit more afraid of Buck. So he goes. Um, he shows up at the girl at the hotel. He walks upstairs. Buck starts getting lucky. The mother is still shown. It keeps cutting back to her, just like trying to break out of the yeah she's still tied she's to tied. the bed yeah and she's like like really like trying to break out and she's thrusting on the bed and slamming it and they keep cutting back they cut to the girl and all the while the most odd little country song is playing in the background here and the line that they, i remember it says a cowboy is true to his word but it just, well, it just actually seems... this was one of my favorite parts of the movie and i don't know why but you have so you have a woman tied to the bed you have Buck up there just, you know, doing his creepy thing with, with his girl. And you've got Judd down there just basically pacing like a tiger, not knowing yeah. what to do. And he's got this music cranked up as loud as it goes, trying to cover up the sounds of the woman tied to the bed who is trying to get, trying to escape and also cover up the sounds of Buck and his girl. Yeah, it's kind of funny, actually. And and, and the funny thing is Buck's like, would you turn that stuff off? And he's yelling down. <laughs> it's like, it was, yeah, I actually, it's funny, as crazy and weird as that scene was, it actually was quite enjoyable. Well, and I was, I was, it was, I was one laughing. Of those, it, it was one of the few moments where the weirdness actually worked for the movie rather than against it. Yes, yes. And it was that, that little bit, just enough comedy in there to, you know, it was comical. It's like, I, you know, you got this guy who's obviously deranged and you, he's all, you know, it's almost, you, you have to laugh at his attempts to try and, uh, and, try and cover it up because yeah. he ends up. And, the, and the, by the way, the little girl is still crawling under the house. Yes, they still, and they keep cutting to her. And at one point, I think the alligator actually comes through and chases her to the other side of the. Uh, the under the house but she's still under there she still cannot get out from under the house i think at one point she actually falls asleep yeah <laughs> and and wakes up so i you know i it's kind of funny that she's still there you almost forget about it but then they 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 cut every so often to get there so i at one point i guess buck is just tired of hearing this song so he gets up to go down and and i, I either turn it off or beat the crap out of a judd and he hears the girl screaming so he goes to investigate downstairs because he hears at this point i think it's a little girl that screams and he hears it so he goes down there and i guess he starts uh getting he gets into some kind of fight with judd and judd eventually just pushes him into the water when his back is turned and he's eaten by the croc so which was inevitable i mean you knew you knew from the second he appeared in this movie that he was pretty much a goner right <laughs> and you know that you could finally get the payoff on that and so now he, buck's girl hears i guess all the ruckus and he she comes running down 
and uh, Judd brings out his his uh, his classic haysicle yeah. again <laughs> and goes after this girl. And this is actually was a pretty cool scene. I thought he goes chasing her through the woods, and it was actually that part wasn't that badly done. So it was kind of cool that he could, he was he's chasing her through the woods. You just assume she's gonna get it, but she actually escapes yep. as a, a motorist is coming by. So I don't know what she did. She had she really goes against every horror uh, cliche. She she had all the characteristics of someone that's supposed to get killed in this movie. But yet she escapes, and that's another similarity that Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> well, wears. I enjoyed that sequence because it really this whole movie takes place between the hotel, the brothel, and maybe you know the the, the brief scene at the sheriff's office and the brief scene at the bar. Uh, but it's so it's very claustrophobic in that way. So with him chasing her through the woods, at least you got to get out of that environment for just a little bit. Right, right, and it, and it was actually it was pretty well done for the for, for the in compared to the rest of the movie, that was definitely one of the highlights uh, in terms of filming, in that. <laughs> so, so then while that happens, I guess Libby arrives back at the hotel, um, and she goes upstairs, and uh, I, I, you know obviously they're at that point they felt they needed to to ramp up the uh, the nudity. So she, what I thought was just taking off her jacket, turns out to be her outfit, I guess. <laughs> so she disrobes and sits there and is uh, just hanging around in her underwear for a while and topless. And she hears the mother, because I guess he forgot to turn back up the radio for yeah. <laughs> some more distracting country music. And so she gets her clothes back on. So really, that scene was obviously just played for the gratuitous nudity of yeah. course and so she goes uh runs out and sees the mother tied to the to the bed so she tries to go uh rescue her and this is where just a lot of stuff starts happening so he rescues uh the woman she rescues the woman they both try and go out the door and up comes judd with his his trusty haysickle one more time and ch- chases chases her uh the mother but Libby gets, I guess, gets around him. He gets down there and encounters the little girl, Angie, who is now climbing a fence. And as soon as she sees her, like, I, I guess she just passes out and falls backwards, <laughs> hanging by her leg on the fence. Yeah, it was, it was another weird scene. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was comical, actually, because it happened so quickly. She just falls over. But so now at this point, so then... Uh, the mother gets down, and actually, the mother who is uh, at that point, I, I assume she was sliced. She's bleeding out of the leg, and she's a little sore. She goes and uh, she's tussling with Judd, and she flips his legs, and he goes flipping over the fence into the water, or down, I guess no, down down to the edge of the water, and his trusty pet croc croc comes out and basically just. Bites him on the head and drags him in the water. So the the tables are turned, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> the villain gets his comeuppance. Yes, and he is pulled into the water, and in the which I only imagine was probably a really thought of iconic shot that was supposed to probably end this masterpiece of horror. You see Judd's wooden leg, which was foreshadowed earlier, just floating and sinking into the water. Although I don't know why it was wood should have i guess floated at the top I, don't know. <laughs> I guess it sinks and that's the end so a surprising yeah. surprisingly high survivor count yeah which is it's a decent body count but also a decent survivor count yeah so and that is eaten alive so not toby hooper would go on thankfully to make much better films than this so this is a little aberration in his filmography but uh, you know, it does have some interest to horror fans, like you know, with the uh, Robert England and Marilyn Burns and, and, and Carolyn Jones and, and those guys. Seeing those, and those... technically Kylie Richards. Yeah, and Kylie <laughs> Richards too. I mean, as far as a who's who of uh, you know horror personalities, you know, there's this movie's quite chock full of them. So, yeah, and and I, I that's why I think I would recommend it only for that, for the nostalgia of seeing some of these these actors and actresses you know in, in other in another horror film because you know i mean as far as i'm concerned i'll watch robert england in anything so so we had a trivia question 
last episode. So before we get to this week's trivia question, the trivia question for last episode was regarding the Manitou, and it was what unique marketing gimmick did the Manitou use to promote its premiere in South Africa? And the answer to that is that the invitations to the premiere were printed on vomit bags, like you get in a in an airline. Kind of a weird choice for that movie because there's not anything. <laughs> per, I guess there's something. Per, I guess a tumor growing out of the back is kind of gross, but it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't overly gory. But yeah, interesting little bit of trivia there for you. But that's when they marketed movies like that. Well, you know, I mean, if you see the early. Uh, you know some movie trailers when they're like don't tell people the ending yeah <laughs> we'll have nurses on standby yeah i mean that was that it is it, it was brilliant mark and it got you you know i'm sure it was definitely ramped up the excitement for that film so right so we have a trivia question for this movie yes so believe it or not this movie was loosely based on a true story about a man who owned a bar with an alligator pit which he used as an entertainment attraction so the question is, what is the name of the real person? So yeah, so as crazy as this movie sounds, it was loosely based on something. Very, very, <laughs> very loosely. Yeah, very loosely. Yeah, it's as far as I'm concerned, there's no uh, poker playing madams attached to this film at all, <laughs> to right. the real story at all. <laughs> so uh, as usual. We would love to hear your feedback. We've gotten some some great downloads for episode two, uh, some great numbers. Uh, so we really appreciate everybody that ha- has been downloading the podcast and listening to it. Oh yeah, and actually, I would want to give a shout out to a friend of mine that said he he, he downloaded the podcast and he enjoyed it a lot. And his, it's my friend Daniel Rivera. He was just actually was talking about it today. He was very excited that we were recording episode three, and he's looking forward to it. Yeah, so we really, re- really appreciate that. We love to hear your feedback. You can get up with us on Twitter. We are at Civil Gore Pod. You can find us on Facebook, and you can also shoot us an email at Civil Gore Podcast at Gmail dot com. And as usual, tell your friends, and if you would, leave us an iTunes review. Yes, we. Ha- I think we have two on there right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, the more, but, the more, but they're the both good. Yeah, they're both good. So that's a that's a plus. Yeah, so we yeah we really appreciate you guys listening, and we have a lot of fun recording this. Uh, I hope you have just as much fun listening to it as we have making it. Yes, it is. I I have to say, you know, it, each episode we do, I get more and more excited to do the next one. So that's always a plus. <laughs> yeah. So we will see you guys next week with probably a Bill Paxton tribute. Uh, yes, we'll see you then. Take it easy, guys. <laughs> Name's Buck. I'm wearing the...